But we're going to start. That direct democracy in action. None of this representative stuff. Okay, so I want to l welcome you all to uh, Black Hat here. It's uh, our largest ever, you may notice, uh, in terms of both uh, attendee numbers, number of sponsors, uh, and number of speakers. Uh, to accommodate this, we added a fifth track of speaking, which uh, is going to be a little difficult to find since I don't think we've used it uh, for at least three or four years. It's downstairs at the bottom of the escalator, so you can either take the elevators, go down those escalators and find it. Um, that's where the mysterious fifth track is going to be. Okay, so I want to apologize for the early hour. We try not to start this early usually because we are in Las Vegas. But uh, we have so many speakers this year, so many people have submitted. We turned down over 200 presentations. Um, and so we hope we pick the right ones. But uh, every year we take a risk and accept ones that uh, uh, we're not too sure on, but we're hoping to, hoping to strike gold. But you can't do that unless you, uh, you know, drill in some weird places. So. What we really need you guys to do is uh, perform some feedback, let us know, you know what happened with the presentations, what you enjoyed, and, uh, and what you didn't. Uh, if you haven't been to a black hat before, you know that we pride ourselves on trying to have uh, viciously vendor-neutral presentations that are uh, technical to very technical. And so to this end, I'm expecting you guys to perform some kind of karate chop action against anybody that appears to be violating this rule. If they appear to be pitching a product uh, or kind of uh, too closed-minded, you're there to remind the speakers that um, they're here to help educate you. Uh, they're not here just to preach at you and then walk away. And so to that end, we encourage our speakers to attend and stay the whole uh, sessions, to be at all the breaks, to really spend some time getting to know you. And uh, I think that's one of the only ways you're really going to to learn. I mean, there's a lot of social networking that goes on at this show, but uh, we want the speakers to really be a part of that. And I think Adam Shostak pointed out that uh, the speakers really enjoy talking to, to other interesting people, and so if nobody's talking to them, they'll talk to each other. So if you see like a little circle of speakers in like some kind of hacky sack circle, um, that's just because nobody's bothered to interrupt them yet. So don't be turned off if you see a bunch of speakers talking to each other, um, just because they haven't found anybody else to talk to at the moment. Let's see, also new this year, we've added this passport game um, with some of the vendors and uh, sponsors. And uh, you'll see it in the little pullout. You have it right there, I think, in the little pullout section. I'm supposed to point that out because it is new and uh, we don't want everybody to miss it. There are prizes involved, so there's free swag involved. Um, also, another way to win free stuff, uh, admittance to future black hats, is uh, perform speaker feedback. We select three of them and uh, winners get things from free admittance to future shows to you know, propaganda, t-shirts, uh, free marketing materials, no, CDs of speakers, uh, past speakers, those kinds of things. Um, so please provide feedback. It's really our own way of knowing what's going on. Also, we've added this thing. I didn't know what to call it, so I called it the Four Corners. I talk about it a little bit at the beginning of the book. And uh, we've gotten feedback in the past that people wanted bird of a feather sessions. They wanted something to meet uh, a mechanism to meet other people. So what we did is we created four topics and we're sticking signs in basically four corners of the area out here during the reception. And if those topics interest you, just hang out near them and you'll find other people like yourself. If the topics don't interest you, just don't stand near the four corners. Um, and then we're going to try to seed the corners with speakers uh, and other people that are interested or authoritative in those topics and hopefully that'll form the seeds of some good conversations. Um, if it doesn't work this year, I'll subject you to it again next year. And then if it doesn't work next year, we won't do it again. So um, I want to see by a show of hands of people in the audience, uh, how many people heard about this conference from word of mouth or here because of something a colleague or somebody said? How many people are here from advertising? Something you read in a magazine, something you read in a news group? That's all my marketing dollars in effect right there. <laughs> I'm seriously starting to question this whole concept of advertising and marketing. I think word of mouth is my friend. Man, I could probably buy a Porsche for the marketing dollars. Um, okay, how many people in the audience have seen your mandate and or your budget for security functions over the last year decrease? How many people have seen it increase? 
and then stay the same. So more increases than decreases. Interesting. Um, how many people would like to see the presentations here um, be uh, the same or less technical than you've experienced in the past, if you've attended in the past or maybe read through the book? How about the same? About the right level right now? And more technical. Man, that's tough to fill. There's only so many bright people in the world that can also speak. And so, <laughs> so, <laughs> we try to get a line on them all, but... Um, Okay, and this is one we're trying to figure out also to be a little more uh, friendly to the environment. We really want to uh, find out how many people would be happy with receiving all the materials only on CD and not get a printed program. Okay, how many people want the option of having both? Okay, and how many people want us to only give you the book? Right? <laughs> So what we'll probably do in the future is when you sign up, we'll, we'll give you an option to say if you want the CD or uh, the book and the CD. And if you pick uh, no, uh, we'll know how to print less books so we don't have so many surplus left over. Uh, it still costs us the same amount of money as so the way printing works, but at least we won't have so many spares laying around, which would be great. Okay, so a couple of notes. Turn off your cell phones. You can't see them, but we have secret devices installed in the ceiling, which will fire small paintballs at you should your phone go off. And my liability insurance isn't fully covered right now, so I don't want to risk any lawsuits over that. So just turn them off right off the bat. That would be great. Um, I want to thank everybody for making it the biggest year ever. The speakers, the most number of speakers we've ever had, uh, for taking the time to fill out the presentation forms and uh, put up with our aggressive uh, policy. Um, I want to thank all the uh, sponsors for making it possible. Um, I'm kind of interested to see if PwC and e &Y get into some kind of you know, brawl over uh, accounting practices. Final four out there, we've got two of them. Uh, with the, the two could collide, we could probably settle this whole match right now in one weekend. And also you, you attendees for uh, getting up so early. Okay, enough of all that stuff. Um, I'm going to introduce our first keynote speaker. Um, you may not remember it, but back at DEF CON 2, he gave a great speech. Back when he was in the middle of a, I think, a running street fight with the U.S. government. Um, though Philip Zimmerman does not really need an introduction, um, I see some people in the audience who may not have been born when, um, <laughs> when he really started to get noticed. Um, Besides being known for, uh, for writing pretty good privacy, PGP, um, in 1995, uh, Time Magazine named him one of the top 50 most influential people for this whole interweb, um, internet thing that was coming down the pike. Um, in 2000, uh, InfoWorld uh, named him one of the top 10 innovators. And um, in 2001, he was inducted into the CRN Industry Hall of Fame. Um, he, had a th he was under a three-year criminal investigation for export restrictions of his uh, crypto technology, which uh, went nowhere. Um, but he did say, man, this is grueling. He said he did, they ran an aggressive uh, counter campaign uh, against the, the government, and he did press interviews every day for three years. That's pretty brutal. But he's successful, so maybe that's what it takes nowadays. Okay, with that said, I'd like to have a round of applause for Philip Zimmerman. This is for tall people. <laughs> okay. Um, well, one thing I'm going to do early in the uh, in the talk is to try to get a few questions rather than wait to the end because that makes it more likely that I'll talk about stuff you're interested in. Um, well, I got in this because of uh, uh, my political activism. Uh, uh, PGP originally was a human rights project. But during the three-year criminal investigation, my defense lawyers wouldn't let me talk about PGP being a, a human rights project because uh, pivotal to the defense, pivotal to the prosecution's case was um, 
my intentions? Did I intend it to be exported? And if I talked about it being a human rights project, then that would be the same as admitting that I wanted it to be exported, since most presumably most of the human rights violations were happening outside the U.S. That was then. I'm not sure if that's true now. <laughs> um, but, you know, the statute of limitations has run out, so I can say anything I want now. So that's really what the reason was. <laughs> I did talk about at the time that it was also for domestic consumption to, uh, you know, to protect privacy at home and for grassroots political organizations. In fact, I got the idea back in the 1980s when I was a peace activist. Uh, we were working on the nuclear weapons freeze campaign, and at that time, grassroots political organizations were kind of in an adversarial role with the White House. And so I felt that uh, those kinds of organizations needed to have some protection for their uh, mailing lists and databases and communications on bulletin board systems. There really wasn't much of an internet then. So, um, so that's really where PGP came from. And because of that, that being where it came from, it meant that the design of it was uh, uh, a, a different design than commercially available encryption software at the time because the threat model was different. When you have a different threat model, you design your product in a different way. And so commercially available encryption software at that time, the, the, the main threat model was to protect your your, uh, your business secrets from your competitors. And businesses' competitors had no significant cryptanalytic capabilities. Therefore, 56-bit DES was adequate. Um, that, was, that was in 1991. Uh, but for, if you're trying to do this for human rights, if you look at it in the Cold War context of 1991, and actually I started working on the design of this in 19. 84, and started writing code on it in 1986. Uh, in that context, um, the major governments could be brought to bear to, uh, to the, the, the national technical means of major governments might be applied to, uh, to break this stuff if it was used in, uh, in countries with uh, human rights problems. So that meant that the design of it had to be a completely uncompromising design. 56-bit DES wasn't going to do it. Um, and so, in the decade since that time, um, the, um, the, the, the repurposing of some of the assets of, of, of uh, major governments' intelligence apparatus uh, was, to, uh, was to be applied to um, economic uh, intelligence, you know, to, uh, to be able to spy on businesses in the global economy. Um, and so, over the decade, the threat model for businesses gradually changed in such a way that it began to cl more closely resemble the human rights threat model. Namely, that the opponents might be uh, intelligence agencies of major governments. So, now PGP is a commercial product. Uh, I know, I'm not supposed to talk about uh, products that's supposed to be vendor neutral, but, gee, you know, I spent a lot of time on PGP, and that's what people know me for, so it's kind of... But you know, there's other products that use the same protocol. There's Hushmail for web-based encryption. There's uh, uh, a company in uh, Belgium called uh, Veritas that does a, a, a Unix command line version, and uh, you can you know, get something from them. When it's a lot cheaper than the stuff from Network Associates. Uh, <laughs> Gee, why does everybody laugh when I say network associates? This is a pretty knowledgeable audience, I see. That was kind of a dark chapter in PGP's history. Um, but the dark times are over. PGP is back. <laughs> you know, I, I used to get a lot of email from people that, um, that worried about PGP falling into the wrong hands you know, like uh, network associates at buying PGP, which they did because I sold it to them because we ran out of money and we were about to go bankrupt. So what choice did I have, right? But, you know, all this hand-wringing, this concern, wasn't, I mean, it was all about uh, people worried about it <coughs> uh, having a back door put in it. Well, network associates wasn't going to put a back door in PGP. Um, you know, they wouldn't know how to put a back door in PGP. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it was my engineering team that was, you know, in a position to uh, either put a back door in it or guard it from other people trying to put a back door in it and guess which one they would rather do, you know. So um, the real problem with it falling into the wrong hands, and in fact it did fall into the wrong hands, was um, how it was sold and how it was marketed or, or how it wasn't sold or marketed. And so uh, um, it was mothballed and then it was rescued by a new company, PGP Corporation, and now it's doing very well. For Now it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's making money, which is better than it was when in the first time around where it lost money and it also lost money under Network Associates. So this is a significant improvement. One of the problems that we had was um, <clears throat> um, the ease of use issue. Uh, you know, there was some, uh, there was a university that, uh, uh, came out with a study called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. Uh, maybe some of you read that paper. And it has to do with the complexity of public key infrastructure and, and actually it focused on PGP, but it, it's, you know, it, it applies to all kinds of public key uh, products. And um, it, it, the, the problem is your mom can't use PGP because if you have to understand what a public, how public key cryptography works to use it, then that's too complicated. If you have to understand about certification of keys, trust models, um, you know, how, why, why you got to get people to sign your keys, that, that's too complicated. So um, for a long time, the engineers at PGP wanted to do something about this, but there was never any money to uh, fund a, a major project to do something. Uh, but now there is. There's a, a new product they're coming out with that lets people in a large enterprise have all their email encrypted and decrypted without any training, in fact, without even them even realizing that there's encryption taking place. Um, so, if I mean, it can't get any easier than that. If it gets to the point where you don't even know it's happening, then <clears throat> that's ease of use. Um, so look for that when it comes out. I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about it, but uh, you can always ask the company. Um, anyway, if you... Um, Oh, you know, one thing that somebody asked me to do before I came, uh, came up here this morning was uh, they wanted to have some PGP war stories. So I guess I'll have to tell you some PGP war stories. <laughs> um, one, of, one of my favorite aspects of, uh, of the PGP project was um, how we got the source code out of the country. Um, I mean, in the early days, it was just a matter of publishing it on the internet, and then it gets out of the country. The problem with that is that it's liable to get you indicted for uh, violating the Arms Export Control Act. So new methods had to be developed, um, especially if they're, if they're actually looking at you to see if, you're, you know, they're, if they're preparing to indict you, then, then any new methods you have for getting the source code out of the country had better not resemble the old methods that got you in trouble. So we came up with the idea of publishing books with source code in it in an OCR font that could be scanned in in Europe uh, with checksums on every line. It was a really good checksum scheme too, you know. Um, actually, the book, the, the uh, publishing in a book was uh, originally started with MIT, and, but for entirely different reasons. It had nothing to do with getting source code out of the country because at that time the source code was already outside the country. But it was actually part of the defense effort. Um, see, um, uh, Bruce Schneier had a book, Applied Cryptography, which many of you have read, I'm sure. And in the appendix of that book, there was uh, a lot of source code. So um, um, Phil Karn at, um, at Qualcomm uh, took a copy of, Phil, of Bruce Schneier's book and applied for a commodities jurisdiction from uh, the State Department, asking, that, that if it can be exported. And they said, of course it can be exported, dummy. It's a book, you know. Don't ask us these stupid questions. <laughs> so they gave him the commodities jurisdiction. What they didn't realize was that Phil Karn had a dastardly plan that five minutes after they gave him the commodities jurisdiction, the CJ, um, he applied for another CJ, but this one for a floppy disk, containing the same source code that was in the book. Um, it was exactly the same source code that was in the book. And, they, and they, when they saw this, they, they, they kind of blanched and said, oh my God, we've been had. Um, 
And they said, no, you can't have a CJ for this. This is software. And he said, but it's the same as in the book. In fact, it's, 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 it's less than the book because it's only the appendices of the book, just the source code. And um, they still said no. So he appealed it, it through administrative appeals, and they kept saying no. So he sued them. So they were actually defendants in a civil lawsuit. And um, MIT Press um, approached me, and uh, they wanted me to do something with PGP. And I said, well, how about if we publish the source code in a book? And they said, OK. And so they published the source code for PGP 262 in a book, which was the current version at that time. And uh, it, it was a very boring book, let me tell you. The only thing it had in it that it was readable was the introduction. Um, and the, the, the idea here was that we would apply for a CJ. And actually, it was, the, it was MIT Press that would apply for the CJ, the commodities jurisdiction. And either the government would say yes, or they would say no. And if they said yes, that's great, because um, then we would do the same thing Karn did and apply for another CJ for the floppy disk. But, um, we didn't expect them to say yes. In fact, if they said no, that wasn't so bad either because then we could make a big stink about it because they were trying to stop a book from being exported by a major academic press, a prestigious academic press. And actually, MIT wasn't waiting. As soon as they applied for the CJ, they began shipping the books to their, uh, to their uh, sales channels overseas. So they didn't actually wait for permission. Um, so that was actually going to be used at trial if I was indicted in the original, in, for the original case. Uh, but it turns out the government didn't actually say yes or no. They just didn't reply. The reason why they didn't reply was because they were defendants in a civil lawsuit from Phil Karn. And they were afraid of screwing things up for their defense. So they were kind of pinned down. So this was a multi-front war, thank goodness. I think a civil case is a, is a lot more comfortable uh, uh, venue to, to decide these things uh, instead of a, um, a criminal prosecution because nobody goes to jail in a civil case. Um, so that was the original reason for publishing the, the source code in a book, and it wasn't really that scannable, it, the font wasn't that good. But what happened years later when I started a company after the government dropped their case was um, we really did want to export the source code. And uh, we certainly weren't going to do it the old-fashioned way, the way I did it you know, by publishing it on the internet. Uh, we knew that, you know, you get, you get an electric shock when you get that. So um, we, we published it in a book with checksums on every line. And, and, um, and, and there were three things we had to do to make this book exportable. We had to put it in a public library, which we did. We had to make it available in bookstores, which we did in Palo Alto. Um, <laughs> And the third thing was that you, you had to pass it out and make it available at a public conference. Well, it doesn't really matter what kind of conference it was. It could be a conference for, you know, shoe salesmen, you know. It doesn't have to be anything to do with crypto. Well, we didn't know of any shoe salesmen conferences, but there was going to be a, a cypherpunks meeting. Um, so we thought we'd pass it out at the cypherpunks meeting. And, <clears throat> you know, I'm, we were sure that those cypherpunks wouldn't do anything like ship those books out of the country. <laughs> so we, held, uh, the, we had the cypherpunks meeting in, in the same building that our offices were in, which was a bank building. And, um, and so um, I wanted to have a public record of this meeting so that everyone would know in case there was a, if ever, if there was a prosecution or something, it, you know, we could have many witnesses say exactly what ha happened at the meeting, that we passed out this book for free, by the way, 5,000 pages of source code, <laughs> a whole box for each book, um, and that everyone would clearly remember the events of the meeting. Um, they would be able to say on the witness stand exactly what happened, or say to the press exactly what happened. And so at this meeting, which was a typical cypherpunks meeting with a lot of different business that they had, um, <clears throat> There was a guy named Lucky Green, who, that's not his real name, um, but that was his online name. Uh, he got up and he announced, um, this is part of the general announcements for the cypherpunks. It turns out the cypherpunks, I don't know if you folks are familiar with the cypherpunks, but I'm sure you are. It's the Black Hat Conference. They tend to be a bit libertarian. <laughs> and not just about crypto. So Lucky Green stands up and he says, 
Well, I'd like to announce um, <clears throat> the next meeting of the, um, the Cypherpunks um, shooting club. Uh, we're going to go out uh, next Saturday and go shooting. And you're all invited to come along if you want to come with us. And he unzips this bag and he pulls out an AR-15 assault rifle. You know, I was keenly aware of the, of, the, of the public relations sort of nuances of this battle we were in with the government. <laughs> and this wasn't really helpful, you know. He could have waited till next week's meeting or something, you know, <laughs> to talk about this. So that was like the worst possible thing that could happen. I mean, what a dramatic thing. It looked like something out of a movie, you know. He, like, he was about to start shooting people. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, fortunately, nothing ever happened that required us to call forth all the witnesses that were at that meeting. So anyway, um, I, so I'd like to get a few seed questions from the audience to give me some guidance on what you'd like to hear today. What are your thoughts about the Open PGP project? Ah, the Open PGP project. Well, years ago, um, when um, PGP, the first round of PGP, when it was my company, um, we knew that there would come a time when maybe the company might be sold to another company. And we might lose control of PGP. And so I felt it necessary to launch an escape pod. And so um, we started a, a working group in the IETF to make a standard for, called OpenPGP so that any company could implement to the standard and that's where it came from and that was a good thing too because um, it turned out to be really necessary when it was in the dark days at NAI. Um, but anyway, there are several companies, small companies that make products that are compliant with the OpenPGP standard. Um, there's, the, there's GNU Privacy Guard, which is a, um, an open source product. Uh, there's Hush Communications with Hushmail, which is, makes you know, perfectly compatible PGP encrypted messages, keys, signatures, and everything. Um, there's uh, um, uh, Veritas in Belgium. Uh, there's a few other companies. If you go to openpgp.org, you can see a list of companies that make products and services that are compatible with PGP. Uh, the biggest one now, of course, is PGP Corp, uh, but they still encourage other companies to make things compatible with it. There's a company in Germany that uh, makes, that makes OpenPGP compliant uh, software, uh, Gluck and Kanya. Uh, they don't have a lot of visibility in the U.S., but I understand that they're, they're pretty visible in Germany. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Yeah? Well, yeah, PGP is still a human rights technology project. Uh, there is a, there's a group called MARTIS, I believe, that, that makes uh, technology for human rights groups. And I've been wanting to talk with them, but I just haven't had a chance to sit down with them. So if you, want to, if you know anybody who uh, needs help on that, have them give me a call. If you go to philzimmerman.com, it has all my contact information. Spell Zimmerman with two N's, the German spelling, because there's another guy named Phil Zimmerman. com. He has a website too, and he's got a link to my site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Over the next how many years? <laughs> 15 years, over the next 15 years? Did I hear you say 15 years? Well, it's actually been about 12 years, but yeah. Uh, he wants to know what I'm going to do over the next 15 years to improve PGP. Well, the first thing I, I'd like is that at the end of that time, I definitely expect sky cars. Where are the sky cars? This is the 21st century. We were promised sky cars. <laughs> so.
so looking ahead to your question, I think, you know, at the end of that time, I want to use whatever money we earned selling PGP and making improvements to it to buy a sky car, because I want a sky car. <laughs> um, well, the, I, you know, I don't know that far out, of course, but uh, the biggest thing right now is this, uh, is this increase in usability with this, um, what they're doing, they're making a, uh, a, a proxy server that um, encrypts and decrypts all the email going in and out of an enterprise, uh, with or without the participation or intervention of the individual employees in that enterprise. Um, so that vastly increases the amount of uh, encrypted email traffic, uh, at least coming from enterprises that buy one of these little boxes. Um, you know, then we have to reassess how, whether that solved the usability problem. I think it would, but I thought that adding a GUI to PGP would solve the usability problem, but that didn't. Um, it's hard to look beyond that. I mean, if you're just saying, focusing it only on PGP. Now, if you broaden the question to, you know, how crypto might be applied over the long range, I think crypto will be applied in a lot of things. I think it will become ubiquitous and invisible. All the wireless communication will be encrypted uh, with link encryption. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're going to become increasingly wireless with smaller and smaller cells. Um, um, you know, there will be ubiquitous computing. You know, perhaps some of you may have heard of ubiquitous computing where there's computers everywhere. Well, all that stuff is probably going to be encrypted communications. So, encryption will just disappear into the ambient noise. <laughs> Actually, noise. It does kind of look like noise. It's white, you know. Um, now, it's, as far as uh, PGP is concerned, you know, there's, um, the, the market share for PGP is, is, is where it should be. It's just that nobody encrypts their email. I think of this, these two pie charts. If you look at all the email in the world, remember, PGP was just for email, so that's why it doesn't apply to where I think most encryption will take place. Like a lot of encryption is taking place with web browsers, with SSL, and that's, you know, that's probably used more than PGP. People don't even realize it's going on. Um, but anyway, all the email in the world, if you make that a pie chart, only a thin sliver is encrypted. But if you take the thin sliver and expand it into a second pie chart of all the encrypted email, nearly the entire pie chart is PGP. Or I should say open PGP, you know, and it, it's, it's encrypted in that format. There's there's almost no other format or protocol used for email encryption, despite the fact that there is uh, a big uh, deployment advantage of uh, SMIME in Microsoft products. Um, <clears throat> I think it comes free with uh, Microsoft Office. So there's more copies of SMIME floating around out there, but nobody knows that, that they have them and nobody uses them. And the reason why they don't use them is because of the activation energy required because you have to have a, a fully functional public key infrastructure before you can do anything with SMIME. So that high step function in activation energy required to start using it is, is, is too high for most people, most enterprises, and so it never gets used. PGP can be used right out of the box, and that's, that makes it so it's more used even though there's less of it around. So I'm, I'm uh, proud of the second pie chart but I'm, I'm not proud of the first. The first is embarrassingly small. And if you asked me 10 years ago how much encrypted email there would be 10 years in the future, I would have thought it would be most email. Not that I would have predicted that it would all be PGP. You know, that would be, that would be too arrogant. And I certainly wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you're asking if the government's position on encryption would change? Well, I think the government's position on encryption already has changed. Um, you know, um, we beat them in the 1990s. Um, the crypto revolution is, um, 
we won. You know, we they tried to stop us both domestically and and with export controls. They didn't really have a lot of uh, a lot of traction on doing it domestically because of the legal precedents that we had. You know, the people were already uh, it was already legal to use cryptography domestically. Uh, but there were export controls in place, and we had to fight for some years to have them removed. And my case was one of the fronts on that war, the, plus there was also the, uh, the civil litigation of Phil Karn and uh, Dan Bernstein. Uh, and then, so we had things in the courts, we had things uh, in the legislation. Uh, there were several legislative initiatives to, to do it. Uh, and finally, uh, the executive branch did it unilaterally because they were afraid that the, the courts or the Congress would um, usurp the decision from the president. And the export controls were lifted um, at, the, uh, at the end of the Clinton administration. So uh, maybe it's because, uh, they, you know, maybe it's because an election was coming and whoever wins the election would certainly have to win California. Um, but there hasn't been any, any uh, significant uh, erosion of the use of cryptography, or rather, the government hasn't tried to suppress cryptography domestically, and it hasn't shown any signs of turning back on the export controls. And I think one reason for that is uh, John Ashcroft was a senator during the time that we were debating this in Congress. And although there are many things I disagree with John Ashcroft about, um, at least he, that one issue, he was, you know, he was on our side of the issue. And so uh, he didn't change his position when he became attorney general, at least not for export controls. And, you know, the intelligence agencies kind of resigned themselves to um, the wave of the future. They did that before the FBI did. I, you know, I think the FBI probably still would like to see that turned back. But the NSA uh, recognized that it was a lost cause uh, long before the FBI did. So I don't think we're going to lose the ability to encrypt. Now, what might happen is um, rather than restricting the use of cryptography, I think that it's possible we might see some effort by the government to uh, force you to give up your private key if you're, um, you know, if you're the target of a criminal investigation. You may be asked to give up your private key, and, and, and if you refuse to do so, that might add to the legal problems that you have. Um, this is already being done in Britain, although I don't know how well that's been tested. Uh, it's, it's, it's my experience that, um, that under stress, you might forget your passphrase. I forget things all the time. Um, I actually thought that might come up in my own case, but, and I have forgotten a lot of passphrases. Actually, <clears throat> you really can honestly forget your passphrase for, for some things because, I mean, if you're going to use a key every day, then you're probably going to remember that one. But you know, you might have passphrases on other things that you don't use every day. For example, you might have a PGP disk volume or something like that that just requires a passphrase just for this one thing. And unless you use the same passphrase that you use for your your normal key, you might forget it. I actually have uh, several PGP disk volumes that I've had around for like five years, and I can't, for the life of me, remember the passphrase. I don't even remember what's in them anymore. <laughs> and, you know, I've racked my brains trying to think of this, and, it, you know, I mean, I get mail from people all the time asking me what to do when they forget their passphrase, and I, I write back, well, um, try uh, ask psychic friends. So that's kind of a dangerous thing about cryptography. Um, but it also means that, you know, there's some interesting legal questions of what happens if governments, such as Great Britain, or maybe in the future the U.S., tries to require you to give up your, your passphrase or your private key in a criminal proceeding. Yeah. Well, it's not going to go with more hardware. It's going to be software. You know, everything is software. Um, you know, traditionally, historically, uh, the NSA. The question was, uh, 
is, is uh, over the next few years, is crypto going to be going toward more hardware or software? Now, historically, the NSA used exclusively hardware. They didn't trust software for very good reason, as, as since all of you are in the business of, of dealing with problems of computers being broken into, I don't have to explain to you why, uh, why hardware, dedicated crypto hardware is more secure. But the economics drive the, the customers toward software. You know, there's just not enough of these big, clunky, secure phones to give to everybody that needs them. So you need software. Now, there are, there are more smart cards being used all the time. But, um, you know, I don't know if you call that, if that's hardware. Still, most of it's taking place on a PC. Yeah. Well, that was the, the, the question is, um, uh, during the 1990s debate, the, uh, the debate, uh, you know, one of the most important assertions of the debate on one side of the debate was that um, pedophiles and terrorists would use uh, encryption. And, uh, and maybe the question is, well, maybe that, that, that's true, and what are the implications of that? Well, you know, that was the, that was the central question of the debate, in fact. Um, and, and during that debate, at no time did I ever deny that criminals would use PGP. In fact, not just cryptography, but PGP in particular. A lot of people were saying, oh, there's no evidence that the bad guys are using PGP. But I know that they do use PGP. Um, but, you know, we went through a lengthy, exhaustive debate through the 1990s. And that debate had expert participation from all quarters. There was uh, uh, the courts, there was Congress, the executive branch, the NSA, the FBI, journalists, uh, civil libertarians, uh, people from academia. Um, everybody was involved in that debate. And it took years. It took years, and it was a tough debate. And, and that question that you raised was the central question of the debate. Um, and yet, through the years, we came to a, um, a decision as a society that society is better off with strong encryption than without it, even knowing that criminals and terrorists could use, BG, or could use uh, encryption. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> And so um, I think it was a good decision. And uh, I wish the criminals and terrorists did not use uh, encryption. I wish, in particular, they didn't use PGP. But they do. And um, even the worst bad guys that we face today, the worst, the, very, the worst ones that have twisted our society the way it has, um, they use it. But, you know, you have to look at the, at the big picture of everyone using this technology. It's saved a lot of lives around the world. I get email from human rights groups. I put a couple of samples of that on my website. If you go to philzimmerman.com, you can read examples of how PGP has saved lives in other, other places around the world. It's been used in combat in Kosovo. I didn't put that one on the website. I didn't get permission from the guy who wrote to me, but it was used in a situation where there were 8,000 civilians uh, trapped in a valley surrounded by Serbs, and, and uh, they used PGP to coordinate uh, extracting them. And, um, you know, that could have turned into another mass grave. Um, you know, I... I, I, I <coughs> I keep talking about my website. On my website, there is a, uh, there is a real audio uh, news report of when the government dropped their case uh, uh, against me, but it's from National Public Radio. And immediately following that, 
uh, is another report about a mass grave in, Bo in Bosnia. And so, um, you know, it's kind of interesting that those two news items were back to back. Bec and I see it as that that's really what this is about. There's uh, the, the same kinds of tensions that exist in, in, you know, in the Western democracies between um, criminals using encryption and the police trying to, you know, to stop them is at least from a technical perspective, not a political perspective, but from a technical perspective, it's, it, that's indistinguishable from uh, you know, uh, a human rights worker in, a, in an oppressive country using that because he's breaking the law there, you know, and it's the police that are trying to stop him. So technically, it's hard to think how to build something that will serve this need without also inadvertently serving this, quote, need, unquote. But I think that, you know, we have to stick with our decision. You know, it's a decision that we made with our eyes open. We didn't have 9-11 to, uh, to guide us, but we had the knowledge that, the, certainly the expert participation in that debate had the knowledge that things like 9-11 could happen. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I don't know how to distill it in one, in one sentence. I wish there were more microphones in the audience. Uh, the question is, um, is cryptography a panacea? Uh, you didn't put it that way, but that's the drift I get. Uh, to solve all, all security problems with computers, and of course it's, it's not. Um, you know, to the lay public, cryptography seems to be the central technology that if you have strong cryptography, you don't need anything else. That, 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 that equals uh, data security. But at this conference, uh, everybody knows that that's not true. Uh, you know, it's like having a fence, a picket fence. I saw uh, one of the, I think it was at the Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference, somebody showed a slide with a, a picket fence around a house. And one picket was 200 miles high. <laughs> And that's cryptography, you know. And if you have a longer key, then it's even higher, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, does that, does that keep people out? You know, it's kind of like that uh, toll booth in the desert in blazing saddles. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, no, cryptography is not the, um, is not the place that they're going to attack. They're going to come in with uh, keyboard sniffers, for example. All kinds of uh, there are all kinds of opportunities for your opponent to get to get your stuff. Uh, you can have keyboard sniffers. You can plant microphones in your office. You can have video cameras at airports that are just there for other reasons. Airport video cameras are not there to capture key passphrases while you type them, but they could do that. Uh, maybe if you're at an airport in a foreign country, if you do a lot of foreign travel and you're in a country that that you know, isn't very friendly, and you're typing your passphrase on your laptop while you're waiting for your flight, you know, maybe they'll get your passphrase. And so, and, with, and then, you know, I mean, the French have stolen laptops from hotel rooms for people attending the Paris Air Show. From, that's the anecdotal stories I've heard. Um, there's, um, you know, there's that uh, mafia guy, um, Nicky Scarfo, uh, who was uh, caught because the feds put um, a keyboard sniffer on his computer so they could capture his PGP passphrase. He was using PGP. And they didn't break it cryptanalytically. They broke it by getting his passphrase with a keyboard sniffer. Um, I should say, I shouldn't say the mafia guy, the, the alleged mafia guy. <laughs> First thing I'd recommend to his defense lawyer is to, is to 
change the name of his client, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's one giant picket. <laughs> yeah. I don't really think of PGP as, as being that important for stopping spam, at least not the encryption functions. You might be able to do something with the digital signatures, but the, the, the way in which you would use it for the digital signatures would involve uh, a kind of an active challenge response thing, or you would, to, to not, maybe not challenge response, but you would, you would have to have all the good email signed, and I think that's too heavy a burden because, um, you know, there's always going to be a lot of important email that isn't signed that's going to be turned away by overzealous spam filters. Am I out? You know, I haven't seen any of the other things you held up. This is, yeah. I see. See, we, I, that's because I'm short, you know, I can't see over the thing. All right, so I'm out of time, apparently. All right. See, if I'd known that, I would have tried to put more on, uh, more uh, politically inspiring stuff in. Uh, a lot of you are, are a lot of you work for the federal government. I'm told, and uh, I'd like to just say, uh, to the extent that you have some policy execution flexibility, please let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater in our zeal to uh, to catch the terrorist. We've had an erosion of our civil liberties. We've had the, the worst erosion of our civil liberties in, in history in the last couple of years. So we've got to do something about that. Thanks.